Yeah, no, so shift happens. Um, we're very excited about this um, with the young adults as well. This is actually the first time that we are doing a co-series um, with what's going on on Sunday mornings. Typically, we, we just talk about, you know, dinosaurs and leprechauns and everything else that we could talk about. Um, no, typically we talk about things that are very specific to young adults, and we, we find a way to just make it relevant and, and just bring a fresh new flavor to it. But really, I mean... That's exactly what Discovery is trying to do. That's the calling of the church. So why shouldn't we be doing those together? So we've come together. We got um, a bunch of new series coming out, all of which are geared directly towards us, towards our generation, towards the things that we're going through on a daily basis, the, the issues we face and the challenges we face. Um, and one of those things is, you know, at the heart, and this is why I was so excited about Shift Happens as a series, the changing society was at the heart of why we started Young Adults this year. Um, it's a new ministry. We just started up in January. And, I mean, how many of you guys can just look at, in the past year, let, like, don't ignore the changes in your own lives, but just the changes that have gone on in society in the last year, um, the last two years, last three years, just rapid. This is one of the, I'm a history major, and so what I, well, I, I did, I was a history major. <laughs> um, so what I did was I read a lot of history, um, and I wrote a lot more of it. And... I mean, you can look and tell that this is one of the, the fastest changing times that we've ever lived in as Americans and as Western civilization. Um, just from good things, bad things, everything, and a lot of that spurred on by technology, urbanization, things like that. Um, but it creates this, a situation where a new younger generation, our generation, a millennial generation, is now having to come of age and grow up in a society that's unfamiliar to us and even unfamiliar to those that have gone through it before us. What's that mean? It means that we can't necessarily go to mom and pop and say, hey, what was it like when you went through this? Because yes, they went through the first love, they went through the first broken heart, they went through marriage, they went through raising children, job loss, job gain, they've gone through all that, yes, and so there is a similarity, but it's so much different now too, isn't it? Yeah. It's so much different now, and they'll even tell you. I mean, you always hear at least one person above the age of 47, probably, that's my number I picked. Um, 47, that'll say... You know, I'm glad I'm not having to grow up when you guys are, you know, and it's, it's honest. I mean, think about even, <laughs> here's a, one last little example. Think about football. You know, it's something I know I never took for granted. I loved it growing up. It was my favorite sport. Played it all the time. But now it's harder for kids to go into it now with all the concussion awareness and, and just like, oh, man, I could just play this until the time I'm 18 and then risk, you know, severe brain injuries for the rest of my life. It's harder now that we know that, isn't it? But it's also safer. So that's one of the things that we really care about with young adults is how do we do this? Because, guys, guess what? Just because, you know, like we found out on Sunday, just because you come and you found Christ and that's awesome and we're excited about, it doesn't mean you're impervious to the changes happening. And if we as the church are supposed to be the ones making changes happen, then we need to be together learning about this stuff, talking about this stuff, and breaking down exactly what this new society means and how are we going to fit into it and really form it ourselves as the church and as a community. So let's look at specifically around here. Now, some of you guys, how many of you guys are, have only been in Jacksonville for less than a year? Anybody? You got a couple? Less than two years? Three years or less? How many of you guys have been here for over three years? Okay, so you have seen in the last three years a lot of growth. Who's been here over five years? Okay, over ten? Anybody? Okay, now we're getting to, yeah, there's even less, but these, even in just a shorter amount of time, you've been able to notice a lot of change. In the last few months, we've seen... A bunch, of, a bunch of chain restaurants open up, which is always the case here in Jacksonville. Um, yep, Chipotle, Chewy's, um, some exciting things there. Apparently burritos are back in, if you can't tell. Um, what else, though? Today was a big announcement. Anybody tune in to see this? Or am I the only nerd in the room? Today was an Apple's big announcement. They announced their two new iPhone 6s, iPhone 6, iPhone 6 Plus, their new iWatch, or Apple Watch is what they're calling it. A lot of new things coming out of Apple today, um, and that kind of relates to what we were talking about, which is the technological growth, and what exactly is technology doing? It's making everything a lot easier, yes, but it's drawing us together in a way that's never known. You know, right now, we record what's going on here, and it enables us to put that on YouTube, and then we use Facebook, and we use, oh, excuse me, we use the Facebook, that's how we like to say it here. Um, <laughs> we use the Facebook, I noticed I got Kate to say it without even trying to, when she was up here, I don't know if anybody knows that, in her announcements, she said, Get, you can look on the Facebook, and I <laughs> silently pumped my fist, as if I was Tiger Woods, on a Sunday. <laughs> 
What else? Who knows what this is? It's very hard to see. It's so That's small. That's not Anwasa. That's Anwasa. One person. <laughs> Anybody else? Did you know before you were well, beat to the punch? I don't know what I'm looking at. Jeopardy champ right here. Yeah, it's hard to see. Um, this is Anwasa. This is actually it's the Sturgeon City Facilities. Facilities. That was weird. Uh, the Sturgeon City Facilities. This is a program that's right here in Jacksonville at Wilson Bay. Um, for years, like in most rivers in America, the New River, which is hardly a river, <laughs> um, it was terribly polluted. Um, so much so that there is a fish called the sturgeon that was just killed off um, over a four, the course of just a decade. It was just completely eliminated. And it's, an, it's an ancient fish at that. Um, and so in the 90s, they started up a revitalization program. Um, and over the past few decades, the county and the state government have poured a ton of money into it, and it's been actually successful. The sturgeons are back, which was their goal the whole time. Um, but more importantly, it has been a huge educational tool. I know I went there when I was a kid. I went and volunteered there when I was in middle school and high school. It's a big thing around here, um, and it teaches you conservationism. It teaches you about water treatment. You get to go see the sewage treatment facility, which sounds like it's a gross thing, but it's actually pretty cool. Um, they do a couple thousand kids a year go through that program. Um, not just from Onslow County, but a lot of the surrounding areas. Um, and they were today awarded um, from North Carolina the State Preservation or Wildlife Preservation Award. Um, so that just came out today, too. So that's two big things, changes in society that reflect other changes in society just from today. The third big thing announced today, and I know you all are going to be really excited about this one, Hot signs on. Uh, Krispy Kreme is coming to town. I don't know if anybody saw it. They have announced that they are breaking ground next to the uh, Patriot 12 Theater at the corner of Henderson and Western, which is right down the road from my mother's place, which means I'm going to gain some weight, probably. Um, but I'm excited about it, and I'm willing to accept that as a fact. Um, because has anybody not had Krispy Kreme donuts? They melt in your mouth. They're so yes. Awesome. They, they're kind of a mix between heaven and earth. So when we sing Kingdom Come, we're already making it happen in the form of Krispy Kreme donuts. Um, so look, again, this points to some of the rate of change, some of the growth. Um, a few statistics, the Jacksonville Metropolitan Statistical Area, which is a mouthful, um, but it basically means the greater Jacksonville area, to include most of Onslow County, Richlands, Hubert, areas like these that are growing just as fast as we are. Um, since 2000, the estimated population of the Jacksonville Metropolitan Statistical Area was 150,355. In 2009, it grew to 173,064. And then now, in 2014, Forbes estimates it at 185,000 plus. So, in the last 14 years, it's been a growth of, if my math's correct, 30,000 plus people. So, in the last just two years, or five years alone, there's still been a large surge. It's averaging about 2,000 people a year in that time frame. Not to mention, Forbes also ranks us 26 on a list of the best small places for businesses and careers which might be surprising, but it is impressive. It's ahead of Waco, Texas. So cult life is big there, as we know from back in the 90s. Did that go over what many people said? OK, anyways. Um, <laughs> Greenville, North Carolina, and Blacksburg, Virginia. So Jacksonville's doing some big things. Krispy Kreme is coming to town, guys. <laughs> and that's about as big as it gets. I want you all to think about me. And just so you know, the, when the red light comes on, it means the donuts are fresh. fresh. It means you, you hop in no matter where you're going, even if your wife is in labor. <laughs> so tonight, there was supposed to be another slide there um, that said, shift happens. And then to the, the title of tonight's, I don't want to go looking for it, so it's probably going to pop up randomly in this. Um, tonight, we're talking about cognitive dissonance. How many of you guys are familiar with that term? It's a weird term, I know. Cognitive dissonance is a term from psychology, um, and it basically what it alludes to is whenever your mind is at, we'll, we'll wait to that. What I first want to get to give you the example of is there's two areas, because what we're talking about with shift happens is what happens when bad things happen? What happens when good things happen? How do I deal with this ever-changing, ever-shifting world? And so there's two areas that we here at the Young Adults really love. One of them was one that Pastor Ron pointed out on Sunday, we just got done studying it actually, um, the Sermon on the Mount, it's at the very end, this is Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27, and he says again, I'll read it again, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, notice that's italicized and underlined, 
is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain comes down, the, steam, the, the streams rose, and the wind blew against and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain comes down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. So it's a great example of how, like Pastor Ron pointed out the other day, guys, the rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew in both of those scenarios. What was different was the underlying part, that one man put them into practice, the other one did not. The one that, whose house fell, what did we call him? A wise man, right? And what made him wise? The fact that he put it into practice. The other area we really like to look at is Psalms 1. Everybody familiar with this one? This is one of our favorites. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners takes or sits in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields in its fruit in season and whose leaves do not wither whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like the chaff, the wind that blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. It's pretty wordy. David had a lot of words, and he liked to use them all. <laughs> but you can, again, focal it down to two main points. That what happens to those that are walking in the way of the wicked, that are doing these things that a lot of times we know we shouldn't be doing, those are the ones that aren't that are withering, but the ones that are righteous are on the tree on the edge of the river. And you see the similarity that you do in Matthew, that even though it's along that tr- that river's edge and its its roots are deep and it's able to take up moisture no matter what time of the year, the seasons still come, and it says it bears its fruit in proper season, which means that we should equate that with the fact that well, there, there's going to be times of massive growth, massive harvest. There's going to be times where our trees look beautiful and that they're flowering and they're blooming and that we get to reap that harvest. And there's going to be times where on the outside it's cold and that it might look like the tree has no leaves. And that, But notice it never withers. The tree is never struggling to find water or moisture or just the word itself. So we see that similarity between those two. So here, this is why I didn't want to try to explain it because I had it written down and I knew I would butcher it. Um, so cognitive dissonance it's when conflict arises between your beliefs and your perception values and your actions there's two ways to really look at this when com- conflict arises between your beliefs and your perception that speaks more to your situation whenever you're in a situation where maybe things don't look like they you know God's promised them to be he's promised me blessings that are going to overflow and he's promised me that his kingdom is going to be coming forth and I'm going to make these things happen but maybe you're in a situation where it feels like that's not the case and so you're at trouble in your mind because you're like man what is going on here like this is supposed to be I'm supposed to be fulfilling his promise I'm doing everything you said why is it not happening why why and how many I mean I know I've definitely been in that situation where I'm wondering like is there is this the promises is this the fulfillment right here because this this is not what I was hoping is going to be and then there's times where values and actions, where your values and your actions seem to conflict. And that speaks more to your behavior. Maybe there's times when a lot of us, when we first get saved and we get fired up and, and we're really motivated and ready to make these changes in our lives and go out and help others make changes in their lives, but it's like, ah, I just, I keep messing up because I still can't stop getting blackout drunk all the time, you know? Just, just so you know, we're, we're going to keep it. Very real in here. So don't act like nobody's been blackout drunk. I'll go ahead and admit it. I've been blackout drunk before. Um, and it can be a big impotence in trying to go out and make it set an example, right? Yep. Because the next day you don't want to get up. Nope. Right? <laughs> Even more importantly, though, it's hard to go out and maintain being an example, being a proper example whenever you're doing that. It's hard to go out and for people to see you out at hooligans one night, and then the next night you're like, on, on stage on Sunday playing your guitar, right? Yep. <laughs> All you guys play guitar on stage, I know that. So, um, cognitive dissonance, though, specifically, is a t- psychological term. Um, one sci- uh, scientist, psychologist, uh, Leon Festinger, started really ba- breaking it open, the school of thought in the 50s. Um, and he says, the basic hypothesis I wish to state are as follows. The existence of dissonance being a negative tension 
Being psycho psychologically uncomfortable will motivate the person to try to reduce the dissonance and achieve consonance. Meaning, basically, when somebody feels tension at their heart, in their morality, in their mind, what they're going to do is they're going to then try to alleviate that problem. When dissonance is present, this is the second point, in addition to trying to reduce it, the person will actively avoid situations and information which will likely increase the dissonance. How many of us have ever felt ourselves in that place? <laughs> Some of us are very much felt ourselves in that place. And it's one of those things where a lot of times we'll find ourselves in a scenario and it's like, I know what you're saying, God, but that's not what I want to hear. That's not what I want to hear right now. What I need is this. This is what I was believing for. This is the, the way I wanted my promises to happen right here, right now. And it's not happening. What is going on? And it's like, He'll say, you'll come on a Sunday, you'll come on a Tuesday, you'll come on a Wednesday, and you just keep hearing these things that are like really speaking to your situation and to your heart, but you're like, eh, I'll just kind of ignore it, because I'm praying and believing for this to happen for me right now. You know, a lot of us have been in those scenarios and those situations. So, we looked at those two areas that are prime examples of how we should be able to sustain ourselves in the driest of seasons, in the worst of times, and still be ever strong, persevering, and fruitful nonetheless still rooted in him knowing a deeper level of joy and of peace in Christ than we could find in anything around us. So we looked at this again, the situation, your perception, the set of circumstance, your behavior. Um, so how do we eliminate this dissonance? How do we eliminate this point of tension? Well, if I could get it to go. There we go. Beans. Fire and beans. There is a very old, ancient, probably Shakespearean um, saying that really alludes to the principle to help alleviate dissonance. And I know you all know it, so I'm going to start it, and I want you to emphatically end it with me. It's, beans, beans, thou art great for thou heart. The more thou art shall eat, the more you will... Fart? There we go. <laughs> right? The principle being... What you put in will then come out, right? Yeah. Don't act like you don't ever eat beans. Just so you know, beans are my favorite food in the world. I eat them all the time. So, <laughs> But it speaks to truth. There's even in this old, ancient, very beautiful, poetic limerick that somebody a long time ago wrote, probably Shakespeare again. Um, there's, there's a certain level of scientific and biological truth to it, right? Beans, beans, yeah, they are good for you, and they're high in fiber. And they're high in natural and good fatty acids, things that help keep you regular. Which, what happens when you're regular? You fart. So, what's another way we can apply this, though? Again, I'm going to start, we're going to rewrite this, and I want you guys to finish it with me. Christ, Christ, he's good for your heart. The more you consume, the more you will... Art? No. The more you'll make better decisions and reach out and help other people. <laughs> Obviously. I don't know. I don't know why you would think that. Shakespeare, the last part. I know, you but... Tricked us. <laughs> so, you get the point, though. What you start to do affects who you are. Yes. Right? Yes. You get where we're going with this? I got it now. <laughs> so... Romans 8, this is a very, very, it can be heady sometimes. It's one of my favorite areas in the Bible to read. How many of you guys are familiar with Romans 8? A few of us. We are going to actually look at it together. Um, it is everything we just talked about, beans, beans, and what they do to your body. It is all of that. And it is, more importantly, the way you act will contract your command where your mind goes. And this is the... Actually, let me change the translation. There we go. We're going to go to the New Living because it really helps to, I think, simplify some of these yes. stuff. Yes. So, now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. That's a lot. That's a lot right there in just those first four. But you can boil it down to this. 
us in our natural state, in our sinful nature, are unable to fill the covenant that God made with Abraham and Isaac and pass it on to Moses. And so there was laws created. Still, we weren't able to fulfill those, the, all those laws. So what did God do? He sent his son. He sent Christ as a sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, the man that lived without blemish, without any error, and he died. He took on the sin of all of us so that we can now fulfill this. He did it in the state that we are so that we are now capable of fulfilling the covenant ourselves and reaping the rewards and the benefits of that and living the lives that we were called to do. So, verse 5. Those who are dominated, and this is really the important part, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that please the Spirit. Okay, now that scripture right there, very specifically, is telling you. When you do something repeatedly, your mind is going to be able to start thinking like that. When you eat beans repeatedly, what happens? So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. Okay, so now we have a secondary principle. Your actions control your attitude, and your attitude controls where you're going. This is, this is very, we just got done with the Sermon on the Mount and talked about really how revolutionary everything Christ taught was. It went against so many schools of thought at the time and still to current day. And this is one of those. No other ph- philosophy school of thought or culture believes that your actions dictate what your minds do, what, what your mind goes. It's always, well, if you believe it, then it will happen. But here we're hearing something very different. You know, and it's, it can be something that we forget in a very faith-based culture, too. Whenever it's, I believe for this, I believe for this. Well, right here we're missing the first step. First, you've got to act on it. You have to do these things. Then, that'll help spur your belief along. That'll hurt, help adjust your attitude. And then, we'll be able to accomplish these things. So, where was I? Verse 6. So, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind le- leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It, did, it never did obey God's law, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. You can hear that, and that can be very, it can feel condemning, can it? Like, oh man, those that are under the sinful nature can't fulfill God. Does he, he does know what I just did yesterday, doesn't he? Oh man, I am, I'm never going to please you. I'm so sorry, Jesus. And we can end up in situations like that. And then whenever you end up in that situation, the next step is, why even bother? Why even try? I'm just going to keep messing up anyways. But that's why you don't stop there. (laughs) But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember, we all do. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. The next part is one of my favorites. It says, therefore you have no obligation to do any sinful nature. So what does all this mean? It can, Like I said, this is a very dense area. Um, it's one that you can read over and over again and still not make sense of it. But when you finally do, it's one of the more freeing passages in the Bible. Because what it is telling you is this very basic principle of how to break cognitive dissonance. If you want to start being able to have better faith and being able to believe so that then you can be better, start acting better. You know, I don't get what you're saying, though. Like, that seems very reverse logic. Well, here, start with this. You guys already, and this is one Pastor Ron always uses the example, just by showing up here shows that at some level you have that desire. It's you taking an actionable stance, an actionable response on that desire towards pleasing him, towards fulfilling what it is you know you have in life. A step towards being like in Psalms 1, in Matthew 27, the house on solid ground, the tree on the edge of the river. Because a lot of times, the way, the way we've done salvation in the church for the last few decades has very much been either don't go to hell, I don't want to go to hell, I don't want to go to hell, Jesus, please, I'm saved, good, don't go to hell. Or it's been, I need something, God, I need you, I need you, I need you, and you come to him either way for that. And what is going on here is we end up, (laughs) when shift happens, what are you left with in that point, Mm -hmm. right? You're left with, a lot of times, a broken heart. 
because you you never were really putting your belief in the fact that you know what God things might look really crappy on paper for me right now but I know that your love is everlasting and it reaches through and I know that the seasons might come but I am impervious to that because I'm going to be able to fulfill myself in whatever circumstance I am in and I'm going to not always be in this situation and that time of fruitfulness and that season of ripe fruit is going to be coming just around the corner and even if that's all I can hold on to right now I know that your love is enough to where none of that even matters so in our lives what are those changes that we want to see happen where are those areas where we want to be able to make a difference but maybe we felt ourselves held back all you have to do is take the actionable stance and listen this is something we're already doing football season just started right who was excited about that Okay, so a few of us. How many of us are playing fantasy football? I know I am. I'm a, I've always been in a fantasy. And here's one of the things with fantasy football. It forces you to be really into football. You have to follow everybody's stats, even everybody you hate. You end up cheering for people that you hate. Um, I've never, yeah, I still, I have a rule. I'm a Cowboys fan. I know, we can cry later. Um, I, will, I will never draft a Redskin, just no matter what. I will draft an Eagle. I have a little bit more respect for them, but never, I will never, ever draft a Redskin. Um, it's just one of my things. Um, also, I never draft Oakland Raiders. They always get hurt. Sorry if anybody's an Oakland Raiders fan. But the principle is, it forces you to do it. It forces you whatever you are partaking in. Just for me signing up in fantasy football, it shows I have some sort of care in it. Then that carries over because now my friends are going to be joshing me if I'm, you know, doing bad in it. And so what is that going to make me do? It's going to make me really start paying attention so that on Tuesday I can get on the fantasy wire and get that number one free agent one. I don't know. What, here's another example. Who likes The Office? Anybody. The TV show The Office. I know. We have, we have a couple people in here that actually just rewatched the entire series this summer. I've watched it way too many times to be proud of. Has everybody <laughs> at least seen The Office? No. So... Steve Carell's character, Michael Scott, he has a very famous tagline um, that he is very famous for. Does everybody know it? That's what she said. That, that's, yes, exactly. That's what they said. Um, and I don't care, like, you could have never, it became a cultural phenomenon when the show was at its peak a few years ago. And it was one of those things where you didn't even have to see the show. But just by everybody else partaking in it and seeing it on a consistent basis, it became a part of their life. Just by you watching it every Thursday night, you tuned in, that became a running joke around offices and kitchens and everywhere. That's what she said. Everywhere. Everywhere you went. There was buttons. There was this. There was that. It became the thing. And it's still, to this day, and it's 2014, he left the show in like 2010, it's still a very popular thing in our culture. A lot of that's due to Netflix. So there's all these areas where we... We walk this out, this very basic principle on a daily basis where we partake in something enough to where it becomes who we are. So think about that. Think about like what Pastor Ron said on Sunday. If you look at where your friends are, you can look at where you're going. That's another thing that you always hear grandmothers tell you from their front porch, right? While they make you raspberry lemonades. Not my experience at all. It just seems stereotypical, so I used it. <laughs> but it's one of those things that's still very true. Not the raspberry lemonade part, again. But the fact that who you are around, what you surround yourself with is going to happen. <laughs> Another, one more example. How many of you guys play Call of Duty or Halo? Any other first-person shooter? You played it online a lot. That's a good number of ladies in the back with their hands up. I'm proud of that. <laughs> There's a certain tone that you carry when you're online. <laughs> Especially whenever you're getting, you know, killed by a little five-year-old kid somewhere across the country. <laughs> There's a certain level of angst that just torments you. And it just carries over. I, I habitually play a game called StarCraft. Um, it is about as nerdy as video games can be. Um, only kids in Korea play this as hardcore as I do sometimes. <laughs> um, and that's a, that's a very true thing. There's some serious gaming going on over there. Um, but I swear, when I get off sometimes, the most exciting games, I'll walk away and my blood pressure has got to be sky high. I'm just like shaking from how amped I just got from sitting there with my butt in a chair and my fingers doing this the whole time. And yet I can still get so pumped. And it dictates a part of my mindset. I can't stop thinking about how I would react in this situation if you come rushing to the door with a bunch of Zerglings. 
I know what to do. <laughs> and all these examples, you know, they're funny and as they should be. Um, but they are very real. Think about some other more serious areas of our life, guys. Think about, think about the clubbing culture that we have these days. It's not very popular around here because there is no such thing as a good venue in Jacksonville, North Carolina. No. no. We are 26th in job growth, according to Forbes. <laughs> but we're probably 1,000th in, in the restaurant business. <laughs> yeah, in nighttime life. Yes. Um, but it is still popular. I know Wilmington's just a spit away. That's where I lived when I went through college, and it was very. I lived downtown. It was just a hop, skip, and a jump away. You know, you could just as quickly as you wanted to go get a drink down at the bar and. I feel like I got a little dancing itch to me. I'm going to go get a dancing itch. And think about how all the music these days is just conducive to that. All pop music nowadays, it's got a drop to it. That, that's my go-to move. I do the, the weird way. But it's conducive to it. And so that's always on your mind. Guys, we can, we can calm down. I was just dancing. Just, don't act like you've never seen good dance moves before. <laughs> oh, we just saw them right there. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. I found that other one. Our pleasure. Um, but it's one of those things, it's always, Aziz Ansari is one of my favorite comedians. He's, he, does a, he has a bit about it, how it's always about like, get, gotta have a drink, gotta have a drink, and how everything now is just conducive to, when you're at the club, it's like, oh, I gotta have a drink in my hand. Oh, I gotta be dancing. And it's one of those things. It's just from the repeated behavior. It's just from taking it in. It's like that with anything, guys. And it starts just by what we're taking in. I mean, us being here on a Tuesday night when we could be... What's, what's on on Tuesday nights? Oh, yeah. So, huge premiere. That's why we D have DVR. Yes, DVR has made things more easy. Until 10 p.m. anyway. Right. <laughs> so, but the fact that you guys are here right now at 716 on a Tuesday night... Show some sort of effort that you guys want to put into your own lives. Because society is changing at a fast rate, and we want to be, the church should be out at the forefront. One of the visions for the young adults, how many of you guys are familiar with TED Talks? I'm asking a lot of questions tonight. <laughs> TED Talks are one of, one of my favorite things in the world. Um, it's a community of scholars and scientists, just people that want to make differences in the world. They talk about everything. They talk about relationship stuff. They talk about water treatment, which is always my go-to, um, any random thing, if there's a problem, no matter how obscure it might seem, they've found a solution for it, or at least proposing a solution for it. A lot of it is just a forum, an exchange of ideas, of thoughts. And it's a beautiful thing. I mean, the production quality itself is usually pretty great. It goes on all across the world. Um, they're on Netflix, too, if you want to watch those. Watch the Head Games one. Those are good ones to get into if you're not used to TED Talks. And... But it's just people solving problems and just talking about things. Why isn't the church like that right now? Why aren't we the ones solving the problems? Because we definitely can be. Because God's given us the same gifts that everybody else has. And like we saw just with what's your favorite extinct animal, we all have such a unique perspective. God speaks to, uh, to you in a way that he doesn't speak to me. He reveals things to you that he, he doesn't reveal to me. And so it's up to me and you to work together. It's up to me and you to dig in on our own first, though. Because when we start making these actionable th stances and just taking in positivity in Christ nonetheless, when we start taking that in, then we'll start thinking that way. And when we start thinking that way, we'll start making these things happen.